All right, and here we are for Our Mind on Music, episode 21. As you can see, once again, I am flying solo. Uh, my co-host, Leon, was not able to make it today. Um, I'm looking forward to having Leon back as soon as possible. In the meantime... Today we have a, a really um, interesting episode, something different than anything really that we've done before. We are speaking today with Charles Wolf of Charles Wolf Studios. He is a composer, arranger, creator, and also a painter. So I'm going to show a little bit of his art as well, give a couple samples of his music. This conversation is related to what we've been talking about for the last several episodes, which is... Um, inspiration for songwriting and arranging, uh, inspiration for us as music listeners, and also we're branching off now into where does this lead us? So what are the implications of all this? We've been seeing a lot of stuff coming out with AI creations, artificial intelligence, that is creating tons of things. You know, it's been used, it's being used now all over the place, and one of those places is with music creation. So one of the things we're starting to look at is, well, what does that mean for people like Charles Wolf, you know, in his writing? So he's going to tell us a little bit about himself, and he's also going to comment on his process as a writer, and then comment on some of these ideas and moving forward into the future. What does AI creation mean in music and for songwriters and composers? Without any further delay, I'd like to get into talking to Charles Wolf a composer, arranger, creator uh, in the United States currently. Uh, all right, welcome, Charles. Thank you for joining us on Our Mind on Music. Hello, thank you for having me. All right, Charles, thanks so much for, for joining us today. And um, why don't we start with an introduction, if you can tell us about yourself and uh, your background and what you've been creating as a composer, as a creator, uh, as I understand it, for the past at least two years, but I'm sure there's a long story that goes um, that backs that up. So can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm Charles Wolf, a professional freelance music composer. I've been writing music professionally for the last two years, and I've been writing music for over 20 years. I hold a master's degree in music from Texas State University, uh, where I studied how to write music for orchestra, choir, big band, etc. Over the past two years, I'm very excited to say that I've been able to work on over 40 plus projects professionally. Uh, things, everything ranging from video games to film to TV shows to um, podcast, pinball machines, comic book soundtracks, web series, live shows, and more. Fine. My love of music began when I started learning piano at the age of 10. At the time, one of my friends was a pianist and I thought it was really cool and wanted to learn how to do that myself. I immediately started writing music as soon as I realized that I could. I wanted to play around as someone who is very creative. I enjoy painting and I also enjoy um, anything that I can, writing, anything I can do that is creative. I really enjoy those sort of things. And this, writing music is something that is a wonderful creative outlet for myself. And it's a way of expressing myself. It's a way of uh, getting to uh, bring joy to other people, I hope, and have an emotional impact on other people. It's just a wonderful thing to do. And so I immediately started doing that one by the age of 10. Uh, on the strength of only five years of piano playing, uh, I decided to be a music major and went to college at 15 and a half. Uh, I had my bachelor's degree in music and music composition by the age of 20. And by the age of 23, I had a master's degree. Um, then I worked as a music uh, teacher, working on my own studio, teaching piano lessons and guitar lessons, music theory, music composition, music history, and did that for about five, six years. And then the last two years since the pandemic, 2020, I've been working as a professional composer. Getting to use what I actually studied in school. Wow. So from 10 years old, you started studying. And before you were 16, you were in university. That's amazing. And it's such a short time to be studying. I mean, 
I started studying the piano when I was eight or nine and <laughs> started university 10 years later. Um, that's that's amazing. So what was the next step in that in that process? Where are you now with your career and your creation? What are you up to? So right now, I'm still building out my career as a professional composer. I'm always looking for more projects to work on. I'm always looking to collaborate with new people. So if any of your listeners out there are looking for a composer, consider me. Um, like I said, I have a lot of training, seven years of college in how to write music, as well as 20 years of experience writing music, plus the last two years of professional experience. Um, getting to work on so many really, really amazing projects. I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've had, getting to score so many cool things. Can you give us a couple of examples of, of projects that you've worked on, some, some music that you've uh, created? Just to list a few highlights, The Island of Spirits, uh, which is a roguelike RPG by Madox on Twitter. Getting to work with Daniel Calvin, a foremost author of comic books. Uh, he writes a number of series, including American Dreams comics. So right now I'm actually working on a new theme for Daniel. I'm working on a new series coming out next year. I actually can't talk about it, <laughs> but I am working on that, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, I've also been working on, most recently, I released a sci-fi music pack for game developers and for TTRPG role players. That's called Ad Astra. It's on my shop, my Square shop of Toronto of Music, and you can, you can check it out and buy it there. It's 12 tracks of music and 15 atmospheres that are perfect for tabletop role-playing games of a sci-fi setting or for sci-fi video game developers. I also have stems available if people are interested in buying those, and you can get an additional 33 audio tracks if you do so. Um, pretty exciting stuff. Um, I've also been working on a recently released last year a sci-fi lo-fi music album uh, called Venture One, which is my debut album as a concept album. It tells the story of an AI probe that's sent out into deep space and sort of becomes self-aware. And then that process sort of questions his purpose in life. What is he doing? Where is he going? And his relationship to his creator, his father. And it's a way for me to explore some of my own personal uh, growth and some of my own mental health things that I've been working on uh, over the last several years. And it was sort of a culmination of that process and of that inner journey uh, shared through music and through story. So one of the things we've been talking about, Charles, uh, in our mind on music is what inspires us as music listeners, as creators, composers, songwriters. Um, what would you say were some of the earliest influences that you think really had an impact on you, your love for music, and later your, uh, your composing? As a 10-year-old, I was given a cassette player. You could go to thrift shops and for 50 cents at the time, you could buy cassettes. And so I would buy as many cassettes as I could of classical pieces, classical music. The very first composition that I really fell in love with was Antonin Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. Hearing that music, all four movements of it, it's about 40 minutes long. If you have 40 minutes ever and just want to have a sublime experience of listening to really great music, Antonin Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, uh, the New World Symphony, famously. It's his most famous work, uh, and it is just beautiful. It has this sort of fantasy music element to it. It has these kind of rapturous folk influences. It is elegant. It is beautiful. It is bold. It is dramatic. It's adventurous. It's a great symphony, and it's really well composed. It's his last symphony's ninth, and it's excellent. So check that out if you haven't. The falling in love with that compositional work it was just really influential. Um, it has influenced a lot of film writers. I mean, it influenced George Lucas of Star Wars, Peter Jackson of Lord of the Rings. Um, have both mentioned that they listened to that piece, so I uh, can't get much better than that. Uh, that was the very first 
piece of that nature I fell in love with. Then I found um, Tchaikovsky and Beethoven and Chopin and continued from there, falling in love with the music of Mozart, etc. So I have a very classical background, and classical music informs all the music that I write today. I have a very classical sensibility in terms of how I compose music uh, from my training as well as just from the type of music I listened to when I was at a very formative age of about 12 to 14. And most people don't realize this, but that is the age range where you form your attachments to what you consider to be great music. So whatever you're listening to actively at 12 to 14 will define how you listen to music for the rest of your life. And for me, that was listening to classical music, orchestral music specifically. Wow. I find that really interesting that at a really young age, you were so influenced by classical music. You know, um, for myself, I studied with the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. Um, Also from a young age, I was learning that music. I was learning about the the great classical Baroque composers, etc. But I don't know, for some reason, I don't consider that to be heavy influence maybe it's just so ingrained that i just don't even realize it anymore um really for me by the by 12 13 14 years old i was listening to rock music and definitely that was the music that i wanted to create and i saw the classical music experience that i had as tools that i could use to do my to to write better songs basically and to play better um How about now? Like, what are some examples of music that are out right now? Uh, Is there any stuff out there right now that you find really interesting or inspiring? Is there stuff that, current stuff that you're inspired by? All the time, I'm always finding new bands, new composers that are inspiring to me. Um, I love watching film. I'm a huge cinephile. And whenever I see a new composer coming out that's writing really great music, and uh, seeing that impact and how it marriage of film and music is a really important thing to me um, as an aspiring film composer, um, as well as a video game composer. Uh, I really enjoy the process of seeing music and film coming together, and I would say that that is uh, what inspires me the most, is usually new film scores. I've also been exploring a lot of progressive rock um, going back to the 70s. Uh, I'm a huge Jethro Tull fan, and I've been listening to a lot of the album From the Woods. Um, if you've not listened to Jethro Tull, it's a progressive rock band, but Ian Anderson, the lead frontman, is a great showman, first of all, but he plays flute. And so that's the cool thing, is he's playing flute in a rock and roll style. And then uh, From the Woods is a great concept album that deals with... Uh, a loose concept album, I would say, but it deals with sort of um, these uh, English folk tunes uh, talking about things like May Day and the Green Man and some of these sort of pagan roots. It's quite lovely, and it's in a really beautiful uh, compositionally. Uh, the lyricism, the wit, it's excellent. I really enjoy it. Let me bring you songs from the woods to make you feel much better than you could know better than you could know dust you down from tip to toe dust you down from tip to toe show you how the garden grows show you how the garden grows hold you steady as you go hold steady as you join so looking at your catalog sort of your discography that you've built up over the last couple of years it seems like uh you have a really wide range of of genres and of styles that you go with leon and i in one of our earlier episodes spoke about the music business and making money in the music business one of the things that we discovered is that generally music musicians today people in the music business in general have to sort of uh keep their options open, you know? But I'm curious, do you do you have a genre that you prefer to work in? Um, you've mentioned classical a lot. Would you say that that was the style that you most like to work with, given the choice? Okay, so uh, it, while it does vary by project, um, my general genre I work in is orchestral, first and foremost, and then, then secondary to that, I do a lot of EDM music, uh, lo-fi, Synthwave, 
Um, I've written music that is like chip tunes, classic video game genres, SNES style, GBA style. Um, I've also written metal music, rock music. Um, I've written sci-fi things, uh, dystopian things, uh, fantasy music, of course, and and more <laughs> and much more. I think I have close to about 400 pieces of music on my SoundCloud right now, so you can go and check out my full, large library of music that I've written over the last two years. Uh, the main genre that I love to work in is anything that has orchestral instruments in it. That's kind of my my jam. The project type definitely affects it. Um, so as a composer, like I said, I'm very eclectic, right? So I can write most genres. Once you know music theory, writing uh, a different genre is not that hard. It's just what's the instrumentation of this new genre, and then what are the idioms of this new genre? So the idioms could be like, does it have a drop? Does it use uh, electronic drums? Does it use real drums? Does it use, uh, is, it a, is it a band setup? Is it a metal band setup? Is it going to be using that instrumentation? It can be orchestral. Is it going to be like lo-fi-ish and it's going to be using some uh, light distortion effects on the whole track overall? What is the instrumentation? And then what are the idioms? What are the aspects of that genre, that style? I would say my approach to composing is usually starting with the piano. I have a keyboard here and I will sit and play. That's usually how I start. Um, if I'm writing a big orchestral piece, like a big trailer music piece, I will start with on the piano, get the ideas worked out there. Then I'll go and go into MuseScore, which is a free notation software program that's excellent. You should check it out. And using that program, I'll put it for two pianos. And I'll write for two pianos whatever I am uh, come up with. And then from there, I will orchestrate out to full orchestra all 35 plus instruments. And so that's my process, is piano to two pianos to full orchestra uh, for co orchestral composition. Uh, sometimes, if I'm doing something that's smaller and we're doing video game music, that really varies. Um, oftentimes, one of the first things I ask a client is, hey, send me some other music that is similar to the vibe you're looking for. Just get me in the ballpark of, like, what's the instrumentation, what's the sound. And from there, I can, can craft the original melodies, the original ideas, bringing my own musicality to it and getting the genre in place. But if I have the genre to start with, it's a great jumping off point. Um, sometimes I'll write directly into my digital audio workstation, my DAW. Uh, I use Cakewalk professionally. Cakewalk is a free program. Uh, you can check that out if, if anyone's interested in trying to write some music. Uh, check out Cakewalk. I highly recommend it. It does everything you need it to do, and it's free. That's just amazing. So... Really, really cool stuff. It supports VST plugins, and you can plug in other instruments and instrument sound sets and instrument libraries, and it's really, really awesome to write your music. It's very simple, pretty straightforward. It's a nice step up from GarageBand if you're on a Mac. Uh, Logic is the paid version, I believe. Uh, it's a nice step up and similar to GarageBand. So if you've ever used GarageBand, going over to Cakewalk is uh, it's a Cakewalk, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so thinking about your uh, thinking about your process, you know, like how you um, you know take steps towards creating once you do have a project. Um, do you find that you sometimes work with collaborators? Is that not so common? How do you, how do you decide um, what what does that look like once you get a project? Where do you go with it next? I often find that I work by myself. Um, I'm usually writing with collaborating with like one other person and the person I'm collaborating with is the person who's hiring me, the client. And so I'm writing music specifically for them and trying to marry both the musicality side of things with the purpose and the functionality of the music. So if I'm writing for a video game, what does this scene need for me to make it better? Um, is it an action scene? Do I need to make it exciting? Uh, make it move? Is it dark? Is it ominous? Is it happy? Is it bright and joyful? Is it a boat ride? What's happening in the scene or in the sequence that I can bring and elevate? That's what I always try to do. It's not that different from film score uh, and film work. Um, it's very much the same idea of I'm there's something that's already there and you're trying to elevate it. You're trying to make it more impactful emotionally more exciting, more immersive, all of those things. And you're creating a sound world for the game and creating a music identity, furthermore, for the product and for the project, which is pretty cool. 
Okay, that's great. Thank you. So I guess um, more specifically, like Leon and I in um, a very recent episode, actually two episodes, 18 and 19, 20, in a couple of recent episodes, we were talking about um, where do these songs come from? So, you know, you have a project, you have an idea of what the sound is that the client would like to hear. How do you come up with ideas? I mean, now we're not talking about waking up at three in the morning and having inspiration. We're talking about like working on a timeline. How do you actually come up with the ideas and then develop those ideas in an efficient way so that you deliver something of high quality in a short amount of time? So um, for those of you who don't write music, um, it often starts, you can either start with the, the chords, the harmony, or you can start with the melody. I, I like starting with melody as I find that it can inform the harmony. Um, usually the melody is the hardest part to get right because that's the one thing that can be copyrighted <laughs> is the melody. So you have to be careful not to copy anyone else's melodies while you're creating new ones. Um, but thankfully there's enough notes and there's enough variety that you can create things that are original. And so I use a harmonic language, the chord language, that is complicated enough that it's not too simple, that it will make it easy to veer into being very similar to someone else's work. I hope. I try my very best not to copy and to really be as original as, as I possibly can. What's originality? Well, originality is when you have so many influences that you can't tell which, you can't tell exactly. them anymore. You can't see exactly. them anymore. They've all exactly. melded. And as your confidence rises in your craft, your personality steps in front of those influences and that's, that forms your voice. Right. You're wanting to get into writing for music. Um, whatever instrument you play, um, if you don't play an instrument, pick up an instrument, start with that, learn how to play an instrument at a basic level, proficiency would be good. And then from there, if you want to get into music composition, I'd recommend two things. Number one, study species counterpoint. Counterpoint is the art of writing multiple melodic lines that sound good when played together. Species counterpoint is something that I use all the time. Uh, counterpoint means note against note. And it's a way of, if I have a melody running along, and I want a second melody to kind of run along with it, um, but I want them to kind of interweave. I don't want them to fight. I want them to be harmonious, but I want there to be some differences between them. How do I make two melodies at the same time? How do I get them to talk to each other? How do I get them to balance with each other, to be unique and different, but also work together? All of these things you can learn from studying species counterpoint. Um, there's five major species, and if you study the first three or four, um, that will get you a long way in helping you how to write music. So I always start with that when I'm teaching composition lessons. Then from there, study basic harmony, uh, functional harmony. Functional harmony goes through the cycle of creating and releasing tension, and as a result we have stable and unstable moments. The three most important functions are the tonic, very stable, generally the final chord of a piece of music. The subdominant introduces some degree of instability. The dominant, the most unstable chord that wants to resolve to another chord. Diatonic harmony, so this would be like theory one, theory two, at, at the college level. Um, study some basic music theory. Musictheory.net, amazing website. It'll take you through the process of learning more about music and how it works. Check out that resource, it's excellent. And that is what I would say to start with. So learn counterpoint and then learn how chords work and how chords function and how one chord can lead to the next chord, that kind of idea. And then practice. And this is the part that you can't rush. This is the part where there it is a craft, it is a skill-based thing, writing music, and the more time you spend writing music, the honestly the better you're going to be at writing music. I am better as a composer now, I feel, than two years ago. And that was with seven years of college behind me. But doing weekly, daily composing over the last two years has sharpened my skills and made me faster and more efficient. And I'm more comfortable with writing music today than I even felt two years ago. And that's as a professional. And so the more you write and the more you practice writing music, the better you're going to be at it. Okay, so... 
All right, so that that um, leads to a question. I, I'm finding myself like you've mentioned classical music. It's kind of like your your go to. Do you feel less comfortable with other genres? Um, is there ever a time where you think a project might not be appropriate for you because of the genre that you would that you feel would be best for that uh, project? Uh, How does that work in terms of you know? Do you find that you would apply um, classical inspired music to a project more likely than another. I'm just curious how you, how you make those decisions creatively and practically. So I am a bit of a chameleon, um, obviously. So I try to morph my musicality into a genre rather than saying, this is my music. This is the only type of music I write. I write one type of music and I just do that over and over and over again. I'm always trying to write new music that's different. So every piece I want to write, I want it to sound different than other pieces I've written. Unless I'm writing in a set. If I'm working on a big set, uh, a music pack, um, or I'm writing for a soundtrack, then I want all that music to be kind of interrelated and have a similar sound world. And the way you do that is, frankly, through instrumentation. That's how I approach that. Having the similar instruments throughout the tracks creates a unified soundscape. Within each track, though, you can have a lot of variety using the same instruments, um, which is pretty cool. I am not excellent at every genre, <laughs> by no means, but I'm willing to try to write pretty much any genre, um, and I always want to push myself, so I'm always looking for new projects that make me try something new, and I've written music in a lot of genres, but the the main one I come back to, I think my bread and butter is orchestral, but from there I've branched out a lot. I love writing chip chiptune music, 8-bit stuff, I love writing SNES style music, uh, for video games, and I really, Super Nintendo, uh, Super Nintendo, or the original Nintendo Entertainment System, I love writing those styles a lot. Once you understand how music works as a system, then you're just kind of plugging in the music part, writing music is the same, always. It's just what instruments am I writing for today, and then what sort of sound world am I living in, what chords am I going to pick, what kinds of melodies am I going to write, that sort of fit the genre as a whole. And that's kind of how I think about it. Every genre is really the same. It's all the same in terms of writing music. It's just making adjustments to fit that type of music. It's sort of, there's a, there's a meta of it, and then there's like the sub of it. Anyways, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> That's just how I think about it. Totally. Totally makes sense. The The thing that makes me wonder then is I'm just thinking, you know, I, I like you, I try to experiment with different types of music regularly. I don't want to get stuck in one style, one way of looking at music or thinking of it. But I also know that that can be really challenging. And in your case, you know, for me, I'm <laughs> I'm doing that mostly as a hobby. You know, like when I'm writing my own work, I'm not releasing it for any specific purpose. I just do it because I love it. You also do it because you love it. And you have, you know, a specific timeline that is is being dictated by the project. So I guess, how do you approach a, a genre that is not really familiar to you? It isn't um, like I just say, this is the only type of music I write. I say yes to as many projects as I possibly can, and I do my very best to morph and chameleon myself into writing that genre. Even if I haven't listened that much to that genre, one of the first things I do when I get a new project is I stop and I go and listen to a bunch of soundtracks in that genre, if I'm not familiar with the genre, and I immerse myself into the sound world. What does it sound like? Once I have that in my head and I can sing along with it and I kind of get the vibe of what's happening in that sound world, then writing music is quite simple. But I have to get to that place of really understanding the idioms like I talked about before. Okay, so now this is going to seem like a bit of a tangent. It's connected, though. Um, one of the things that Leon and I will be talking about in future episodes is um, basically like the idea that your music of your youth that inspired you, did you have any favorite songs? And also, um, as moving forward or, or as you progress in your life, does, does that favorite change? Do you still, the question I'm asking is, do you still like your favorite song, you know? Uh, when I was uh, in my teens, I listened to a lot of anything guitar-based, really. So I, I loved Van Halen and Led Zeppelin. Uh, a little bit later, I got into Black Sabbath, for example. 
And some of that music I still really enjoy, um, but I do find it has changed. And I don't think, I mean, I liked Thelonious Monk uh, in high school because of a music teacher that introduced that to me. Over time, I would say that I'd be more likely to listen to, to sit down and listen to John Coltrane or Thelonious Monk um, than to put on Van Halen 1984. Not that I'm saying anything bad about 1984. I'm just saying that I guess the way my life is right now, um, the experience that I have in a diff in a given day, might call me to a different type of music. How uh, do you feel about that? You know, do you have a favorite song, which seems very specific, but um, and how has your musical taste? and your influences changed over the years? Favorite song is hard because I love music and I have fallen in love with very, many, many pieces and different composers at different time. I'm a huge fan of Eric Satie, um, Dmitry Shostakovich, Dmitry Kabalevsky, Dobrinka Tabakova, a modern composer. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, all the classical uh, notable names like um, Chopin, Brahms, and, and many, many others. <laughs> I won't sit here and list them all. Vivaldi, I love Vivaldi. Uh, hugely influential on in my work for sure. Uh, my musical taste has evolved over time. Like, I didn't used to like rock music at all. Um, and so, going from only liking classical music and music that was orchestral to branching out and going, no, no, I actually I do like popular genres like EDM and I, I do like. Um, popular music even or at times and I even like things um, like prog rock like the Jethro Toll I mentioned branching out in those ways I'm a huge Queen fan as well love Queen Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? The more you listen to music and you start to appreciate more and more different ways people are just accessing music and writing music, writing great music, but are doing it for different instrument groups. It's kind of the same as what I'm doing now as a composer. And being a composer has helped me appreciate more and more other soundtracks and more and more other composers and their amazing work. All right, that's that's very cool. And I totally agree with you on Queen as well. Now, um, you mentioned a little bit about different genres, different styles. Now, one of the things that we're looking at moving forward with our episodes about inspiration and songwriting, etc., is AI, artificial intelligence created music. So, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is, yeah, you can take existing music, um, the lyrics, the melodies, the chords, etc., combine a few different elements from existing songs and turn it into something new. People have been doing that for forever. You know, remixing, everything is a remix. Um, there's also interpolation. Um, there's a guy on, it seems primarily on Instagram, Luxury is a a creator himself, a composer, songwriter, but also he does these fantastic little videos talking about interpolation. Swedish <laughs> producers Bloodshine Avant sampled some strings from a Bollywood movie. Humans can mix existing elements into something new. AI, that is what AI does. It takes specific things, specific songs or elements of songs, combines them to create new music. Um, what are your thoughts on this, the fact that that already exists, and where do you think this might be going? What are the implications for composers like yourself, songwriters in the future? You know, how will people need to um, respond to that and possibly adapt to that. What do you think? Okay, so for AI creative music, right now we're not really at a place yet where it's going to be um, on the level of a classically trained composer. 
uh, I'm very happy to say. Uh, I think that in the next 20 years, will there be good enough AI stuff that the AI can write great music as well as what I do? Probably in 20, 30 years. That's, that's very likely. Uh, and that's fine. And if people who want to use that type of music that's generated by an AI and uh, you want to go through that process, I don't see anything wrong with that. That's fine. I know there's still going to be people out there who are going to want to have a, a human write the music, and I, hopefully I'll be at a place in my career where I will be able to cater to those people who want to hire a professional composer, a human to write all of the music. Um, is an AI better or worse than a human? Um, not really. Um, and if they get to the point where they're on par, then they're on par. I, I can't really... It's a tool, and it's like any other tool, and over time, perhaps that'll the music landscape will adapt. Maybe, perhaps there'll be genres that the AI isn't as good at, so maybe humans will have to adapt into those genres more. I don't know how that's going to affect the landscape of things. One thing it might do is it might make it faster, right? So if you have AI to help you as a composer, you can get it to spit out some music, and then you can write more music on top of it, and you can speed up your workflow. That's a positive way that, as a composer, I could use something like an AI-powered thing, to write music quicker. If that's an important thing, and usually turnaround is important, usually have a very limited time frame to get music in. My standard turnaround is 10 business days for clients, so I have 10 business days to turn around music that's commissioned. Uh, for If you're doing TV or film, that could be you have a weekend to finish things. And that's normal, so you just have to work fast, and being able to work faster with AI, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. So another thing that we... Uh that we've talked about on our mind on music is virtual concerts. So a couple of years ago, Nintendo of all companies hosted a virtual concert, Maria Callas, uh, the great opera singer who unfortunately passed away several years ago. They have um, recordings of her voice and they've created a hologram of her singing on stage. Uh, this uh, has been now developed by base technology which i don't know if that's affiliated with nintendo i'm not sure the concert is um a live orchestra on stage that is playing in real time and there's a recording of maria callas's voice and there's a hologram standing in the center of the stage it's maria callas virtually Emer Noon, who is a conductor, but also a composer well-known for a lot of video game music, much like what you have done yourself. She was selected as the virtual composer, or I think maybe even live composer, for these concerts. I'll show a little clip of this in a moment. My question to you is, how do you feel about this? I mean, to me, the technology is fantastic. And I'm not sure how I feel about going to watch um, a recreation of an artist performing on stage. I'm curious what you think about that. Bass Hologram presents Callus in Concert, the Hologram Tour. Virtual concerts, virtual concerts are cool. Totally fine with that. Um, any way you can reach an audience. Uh, I'm largely virtual myself in that all the music I write is, um, uh, you know, virtual based and digital based, and all of my audience is online. So virtual concerts, yes, absolutely, no problem there. All right. So I'm I'm gonna think more on that. I think it is very cool technology. I just wonder about again how this looks moving forward. You know, what does that mean for the future of live, fully live concerts, you know? And so on that note, as I sit here in Shenzhen, China, recording, a good friend of mine, Peter, is at a concert right now as we speak, looking at a tribute band. The band is called Hell's Bells. Pardon my language, Leon. <laughs> um, they are an ACDC tribute band. So what that means is they are not members of the original ACDC band. They're, they're fans of ACDC who, who do, from what I've seen, a fantastic job at playing and even visually representing ACDC on stage. 
I have a little clip of their concert that's happening as we speak. Um, so I'm going to include that now just to give you an idea what I'm talking about. So tribute bands are, again, bands that are, just, that are fans representing their uh, musical heroes, their, the, the things they, they enjoy, and some do it really well. Legacy bands now had members of the original band. For example, Leonard Skinner uh, started in the 1960s and has had a number of member changes over the years. The last original member of Leonard Skinner passed away, sadly, in this month, um, March, I believe it was March 6th. And my understanding is that Leonard Skinner is planning to continue. These are players who have played with at least some of the original members of the band. They've been in the band for years. You know, they've, in my opinion, earned that right to continue to play as such even as they replace members. So the question is, what do you think about this idea of legacy bands? And then legacy bands are cool. If you have a band that you're really excited about and you want to share their music with more people and play and tribute them. And I've heard live really great tribute bands before and really enjoyed them. So I don't see anything, any issue with that. Okay, so Charles, um, if you were to guess what you think the future of music might look like, how, what do you think, where do you think we're going with all this? The future of music um, is one where it's going to be increasingly digital. Um, we, it's an amazing time to write music, to get into writing music, because there are so many great sample libraries out there now. Um, to just shout out a few, um, I love using Spitfire Audio. I use a lot of their albums, uh, sorry, their libraries in my music. And they have Spitfire Labs, which is a very cool 50 plus instruments uh, packs and you can get them and they're free and you can, uh, they're VSTs, you can plug them into Kickwalk and then you can start writing music today. It's amazing. I use them all the time. Nice. Okay. So what is some um, equipment, software or hardware that you typically use in a, in a recording session in your day-to-day -day work? Um, synthesizers that I use a lot is Tal Noisemaker, free, Helm, free, Vital, free, all of these things, um, Surge, free. These are all synthesizers I use in professional work, and they're free synthesizers. Anyone can go play with them right now. If you don't have them, go get them. Uh, Odin 2 is another one. There's so many, uh, Dext. There's so many out there, so check those out. Um, you don't have to have a lot of money to get into writing music. In fact, you don't have to have any money to get into writing music. You can just start today. Um, you can do old-fashioned. You can print out some sheet music. Um, Sheetmusic.com, I think, is the place you can do that. And um, you can sit at a piano uh, or your instrument and just start writing some notes on a page and do it the old-fashioned way. And that's a great way to learn. And that's how I've written music before as well. Future music will increasingly be faster and more digital. Uh, I don't see uh, the current rate of which orchestrals are declining. Um, we're going to have less and less professional people at that level playing those type of ensembles. New ensembles are going to form, and new ensembles are forming. I know there's consortiums of composers, uh, especially at uh, some of the Ivy League schools, um, are gathering together and playing and composing new music as a group. And composer groups are a thing now, which is pretty cool. I think more of that type of thing is going to happen. But what's really amazing with the internet and with YouTube and with other platforms in the future that are like these current platforms, Instagram, TikTok now, but who knows what it'll be in 20 years. It'll be something else. Uh, whatever that platforms or platform is, um, there's going to be people writing music. And having the internet, being able to share your music with the world immediately is pretty amazing. Uh, that is huge. And that's something that's totally new to our generation. You know, what you just said there, what you're talking about right now, what we're talking about right now, makes me think of an episode that Leon and I recorded, I believe it was episode nine of Our Mind on Music. I remember seeing an interview with Glenn Gould in the 1950s, maybe early 1960s, and he was talking about the future of music as well. 
And he was saying that he thinks the future of music is recording, where people will be able to make what he calls conductorial decisions about the music that we listen to. Uh, I'm going to play a little clip of this because it's amazing to me how this has come back around again. Glenn Gould, what is that, 60 years ago, is talking about a future in music that I think he predicted really well. Glenn Gould, 1966, has this interview. He Um, says in the interview he found recording really liberating. So much love for recordings. Because it's the future. Well, I think that we're in a moment of transition in um, music right now. And I think that the listener, for the first time, at least the first time since the Renaissance, or the earliest days of the Renaissance, perhaps, has suddenly realized this, has suddenly realized that he indeed can throw his weight around, the very great power that is being given to him. I think it's the power of um, making decisions that are in fact incorporated into the performance and ultimately into the composition of music. He is making those decisions in effect. He is in fact uh, allowing his decisions about A channel and B channel to be interpretive. He's making conductorial decisions. And so he mentions here, he says, I can't pic- picture people in the year 1999 going to a Tchaikovsky concert live. Oh, gosh. I picture them experiencing that in some recorded situation, right? Wow. Where, where the people could then do things in some way using tape man- manipulation or something. They could make decisions that a conductor would usually make. It's like, pretty amazing the way you can connect with so many people. I've worked with clients all over the world, literally, getting to talk with you right now, on the other side of the world, literally. Pretty amazing. So do you see the future of music as as being a positive thing? Do you think this is going in the right direction? Yeah, I would say the future of music is exciting. It's um, Anyone can get into it. Anyone can write music. Um, you don't have to be... Uh, super, super talented or a genius to do it. I'm certainly not a genius, uh, and uh, I would say it's talent is largely skill-based. Um, if you want to be good at any skill, you just have to practice. And the more time you spend working on any skill, you'll be better at it. And that's my experience. It's not about being talented, per se. It's about effort and hard work. And that has been my experience. So um, get into music. Write music. Um, there's always room for more people to write their music. That's never a bad thing. More people means more great music for everyone to listen to, and that's awesome. I think the future of music is exciting, and I'm excited to see what happens next. That's very cool. Thank you, Charles. Thanks so much for taking all of this time to speak with us today. Thank you so very much for having me on today. My co-host, Leon, and I hope that our viewers, listeners, will get a lot out of all of the information, the knowledge that you've shared. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you, hopefully, with Leon by my side to banter with (laughs) <laughs> in episode 22. Hey, again, I'm Charles Wolf of Charles Wolf Music. You can check out my stuff at charleswolfmusic.com, on SoundCloud at Charles Wolf Composer, and you can find me on Twitter, see Wolf Music. All my links are available from my website, charleswolfmusic.com. I'm very active on Twitter, it's my main platform. I'm also on Instagram, Mastodon on YouTube, and others. So check me out at those places too can't wait to see you all there thank you so very much and have a great rest of your day don't forget to like and subscribe good night